The Missouri River, also known as the Big Muddy or Mighty Mo. Murky, meandering, majestic. It is the longest river in North America. In its upper reaches, the Missouri begins with the joining of three rivers, the Gallatin, Madison, and Jefferson in southwest Montana. And it winds its way some 2,300 miles downstream, draining parts of 10 states and two Canadian provinces until it joins the Mississippi River at St. Louis. But we will focus on its upper reaches, known as the Upper Missouri River Basin, flowing through four states. In these dim waters, a pale apparition appears, a ghost fish, mysterious, prehistoric, a living relic of the distant past, the rarely seen pallid sturgeon. Sturgeon as a family are very old, with an ancestry dating back 200 million years. Today, wild pallid sturgeon, living in the waters of the upper Missouri River, are one of the rarer fish species in North America. After millions of years of ancestral survival through environmental disruptions, mass extinctions, and multiple glaciations of North America, this fish is in murky water, both literally and figuratively, and may be on the brink of disappearing forever. As the Rocky Mountains began forming some 70 million years ago, a vast inland sea slowly retreated over the eons and a massive drainage system gradually formed. A drainage system that eventually emptied into a mighty river, the Missouri. The Missouri drainage became home to many wildlife species. Including a wide variety of fish, This abundance also attracted prehistoric humans about 11,000 years ago. After French explorers Louis Joliet and Jacques Marquette floated past its confluence while navigating the Mississippi in 1673, it eventually became known as the Missouri, after the Missouri Indian tribe living at its mouth. In 1804, Lewis and Clark followed it west during their voyage of discovery. Although native to the river at that time, there was never a mention of pallid sturgeon in their journals. Pioneers used steamboats to travel the river on their way west, and they often described it as too thick to drink, too thin to plow. It is fed by major tributaries, including the Sun, Marias, Milk, and Yellowstone. The Little Missouri, Grand, Cheyenne, and White Rivers in the Dakotas and the Niobrara in northern Nebraska contribute further downstream. The pallid sturgeon is native to the Missouri and Mississippi River systems and exists nowhere else in the world. One other sturgeon species, the shovel-nosed sturgeon, also lives in the same waters as the pallid. Some hybridization between these two species has been found to occur, but it is in the upper stretches of the Missouri that this hybridization occurs the least. The word pallid means deficient in color, and compared to other species of sturgeon, the pallid is noticeably paler. In 1876, famed naturalist and paleontologist E.D. Cope collected a pallid sturgeon specimen from the Missouri River near Fort Benton, Montana. It was not until 1905 that scientists differentiated pallid sturgeon as a species of its own. It was named Scaphorhynchus albus, a combination of Greek and Latin meaning spade-snouted and white. 
Although classified as a bony fish, sturgeons are primarily cartilaginous and lack a central backbone, rib cage, and many other structures found in typical bony fish. Pallids and shovelnose are distinctly recognizable for their elongated bodies, flattened snouts, and extended upper tail lobe. This shape is optimal for staying close to the river bottom, their favored habitat, even in strong currents. The two species are similar in appearance. However, the pallid sturgeon is significantly larger at maturity, averaging between three to five feet in length and up to 85 pounds in weight. Both species have four barbels, which descend from the snout near the front of the mouth. The length and positioning of the barbels is one of the best ways to distinguish the two species. Pallids are armor-plated, partially covered with rows of bony plates called scutes rather than scales. The four barbels hanging in front of their mouths are covered with taste buds that act somewhat like our tongues. They use these tactile organs to detect aquatic insects and small fish on which they feed. Having no teeth, pallids are unable to seize prey, but their extendable mouths create a vacuum and they simply suck up their unsuspecting meal. Among all of the fish inhabiting the Missouri River system, pallids are at the top of the food chain. In addition to their mysterious nature, this fact presents another enigma. Here is a top predator like the grizzly bear and wolf, but the pallid is toothless. The upper basin of the Missouri River has seen rapid and tremendous change that started during the first half of the 20th century. Most of this change has been the result of dams. It all began with the construction of the Fort Peck Dam near Glasgow on Montana's High Line. The Public Works Administration authorized it in 1933 with construction beginning in 1934 by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and completed in 1940. The massive dam created an immense reservoir, forever changing the character of a major portion of the area that the upper Missouri River flows through. Through federal legislation, other dams soon followed. The Pick Sloan Missouri Basin Program, initially authorized by the Flood Control Act of 1944 as amended, was a government plan for the conservation, control, and use of water resources in the upper Missouri River Basin. It called for a series of five additional dams along the main stem of the Missouri to be built by the Army Corps of Engineers. Today, the Upper Missouri River is managed by a group of agencies working together in an orchestrated approach. Federal agencies like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Bureau of Reclamation, and Western Area Power Administration cooperate with private companies like PPL Montana to keep the river flowing according to a master plan. The benefits these dams provide are valuable to society and cannot be overestimated. They were built first and foremost to protect people and property from devastating floods. They supply clean, relatively cheap hydroelectric power. The huge reservoirs created behind the dams provide dependable municipal, agricultural, and industrial water resources that are dependable even in times of drought. Recreational opportunities afforded by these large bodies of water result in millions of dollars of annual revenue from boating, camping, and fishing. These same reservoirs also nurture other species of fish and wildlife. The managed flow imparted by these dams additionally improves barge navigation downstream. But these benefits have come at a cost. The cost of that sort of river management is that we have lost native species and we have an endangered species uh, such as the pallid sturgeon. The, the needs of man and mankind in our society today run nearly perpendicular to the needs of the pallid sturgeon 
uh, and its life history requirements. Dams change the way the water flows. Uh, water flowing out of dam is clear and cold, and it, it doesn't flood like a natural river does. You don't have that turbidity, the warm temperatures, or the floods that the fish probably need to spawn, to recruit, to create and maintain diverse habitats. There are fewer sandbars and islands, and banks are now more stabilized with rock. Swift-moving river sections have been reduced, or in some cases, eliminated. Perhaps most importantly and impacting to the pallid is that the free-flowing length of the river has been fragmented by the reservoirs and dams. These large structures have chopped up hundreds of miles of once free-flowing water into smaller segments. During field surveys conducted by federal and state fisheries biologists from the 1960s to the 1980s, only big, apparently old pallets were observed in the upper Missouri River, from Gavin's Point Dam in South Dakota to Fort Benton, Montana. And we started catching some, trying to get a better idea of how many there were. And it became clear to us after a year or two, we really didn't catch too many. There we'd get maybe about 10 or for lucky 20 in a year. And so we could see the writings on the wall for this fish that uh, they were going extinct. It didn't look like uh, there was any reproduction and they were all big, it would appear to us, old fish. Between the 1960s and the 1980s, observations dropped from 500 to 65. These results indicated that there was no reproduction occurring. This was disturbing because fisheries biologists considered this reach of the river to traditionally have the highest numbers of pallets and was considered prime habitat for the species. Because of these concerns, a petition to list the pallet as an endangered species was sent to the Fish and Wildlife Service by Peter Carrolls on behalf of the Dakota chapter of the Sierra Club, requesting that the pallid sturgeon be listed as an endangered species. This petition was filed under the 1973 Endangered Species Act. Due to its endangered status, environmental law mandates that a recovery plan be devised to help save the pallid sturgeon. The 1993 Pallid Sturgeon Recovery Plan by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service identified 15 action items to move the pallid sturgeon towards recovery, including scientific research, hatchery programs, monitoring and tracking activities, habitat restoration, improved river management, and public awareness. The recovery plan identified three recovery priority management areas in the upper basin of the Missouri. These areas are typically the least degraded and likely provide all of the key habitat components for successful recovery of the pallet. A partnership between federal, state, and local organizations formed to implement the recovery plan. This coalition is constantly seeking ways to help the pallet sturgeon repopulate their native waters as a wild species. This multi-agency approach to address all of the action items in the 1993 recovery plan has resulted in dramatically increasing the knowledge about the pallid sturgeon. Research centered on its reproductive behavior as it relates to habitat needs. Eggs are deposited in areas of coarse gravel and cobble and fertilized by the male. After about seven days, the eggs hatch and a larval form emerges. These tadpole-like organisms, or larvae, drift downstream where they eventually settle to the river bottom. After using up nutrients in their yolk sac, they begin feeding and develop over the next several months. But the problem seems to be that the larvae are not surviving. So researchers thought it was important to try and get an age of these large wild pallets that they were catching. Aging techniques were developed. Two parts of their anatomy were used. 
a fin ray, and a small calcified structure in the head called an otolith, which is akin to ear bones in humans. Fin rays can be collected from live pallid sturgeon, but the otolith can only be collected after a pallid has died. With careful microscopic examination from the cross-section of these two structures, growth rings are counted similar to tree rings. Young wild pallid sturgeon have been seen or captured in the upper basin of the Missouri for the last few decades. Scientists speculate there must be problems with reproduction or recruitment. And they're developing along just fine. They hatch off of these, you know, out of the egg and they become free swimming embryos, are free floating actually at that time. And for the next week or so of their life, they're gonna be drifting downstream. You know, in a, in a uh, natural environment, that's a good way for dispersing your young. But in a, an environment that's, um, you know, segmented with dams, it, it, what it results in is having all your larvae drifting into the headwaters of these reservoirs and apparently those reservoir headwaters aren't suitable habitat for these juvenile sturgeon or, or larval sturgeon. Some of the research indicates that larval pallid sturgeon will drift from 11 to 17 days. And during that time when they're drifting downstream, that would cover a distance of 150 to over 300 miles. So there's very few segments of the Missouri River remaining that are that long without running into a dam or the headwaters of a reservoir. Since construction of the dams, the Upper Missouri River Basin has grown both commercially and industrially. With these changes, water quality has been impacted. Runoff from farming and livestock operations can contribute to the degradation of water quality. Oil and gas extraction and environmental accidents are also prime contaminants. Some of the te early testing showed contaminants that were building up in the tissues, uh, including uh, PCB and pesticides. Ongoing water testing and monitoring of Missouri River water also found heavy metals, such as cadmium and mercury. These substances could be impacting recruitment of the bottom-dwelling pallid. Because pallids are long-lived, they have been exposed to these toxins for decades. Even though many of these pollutants were banned 40 or more years ago, they are still found in fish today. Although problems with larval drift, pollution, and habitat changes are the leading hypotheses, the answers to why pallid sturgeon are not able to recruit are still largely unknown. One of the most ambitious projects in the recovery effort of the pallid sturgeon has been the establishment of a hatchery program. In the upper portion of its range, Gavin's Point National Fish Hatchery began holding wild-caught pallids in 1992. Although attempts were made to spawn pallids in the three upper basin fish hatcheries from 1993 to 1996, not until 1997 was there a successful spawning event. This occurred at the Gavin's Point Hatchery. Since then, the three hatcheries in the upper basin have been working to propagate pallids annually. So to buy us time to work through some of these issues, we've implemented a stocking program where we go out annually and collect wild fish and bring them into our state and federal hatcheries where they're artificially propagated and then their progeny are returned to the wild. After sexually mature wild pallid sturgeon are caught and brought to a hatchery, they are genetically tested for levels of potential hybridization as well as relatedness to help decide which male to cross with which female. These data are tracked throughout the life history of the offspring produced by the parents. Once genetic testing is done, both the females and males are given a hormone injection to induce spawning. After the hormone takes effect, the eggs from the female and milt from the male are collected. Milt is the fluid which contains the sperm. The milt and eggs are examined for viability and if they appear healthy, 
are carefully mixed together in water with a feather. Fertilization then occurs and a mixture of clay and water is added to prevent the eggs from sticking together for ease of handling. During this process, the adult pallids used for spawning are very cooperative. When they're in the tanks, when we're spawning them, we have the, you know, if there's other adults in there, they're going to come up, they're going to be nudging you just like a, a puppy or something wanting to get your attention. And when you're walking around the tanks, they'll actually come up to the surface of the water and check you out. After the brood stock is used for spawning in the hatchery, they are given an injection of antibiotics to help prevent any stress-related disease. They are then taken and released back into the river section from which they came. The larvae are then nurtured until they develop into juveniles. While most hatcheries release the spawned pallids and their offspring back to the river, the Gavin's Point National Fish Hatchery has been keeping a captive population sample of pallid sturgeon offspring spawned from wild adults each year. The intent is to establish a genetically diverse captive population of future broodstock. Within this building we have pallid sturgeon broodstock and within each one of these tanks we have different year classes of pallid sturgeon broodstock, approximately 14 years uh, within the entire building. And the importance of this broodstock is it serves as a backup population for upper basin pallid sturgeon. If there uh, were to be some reason that we could no longer obtain adults from the river for spawning, then we would have a backup population here at the hatchery that could be used for spawning and for producing offspring. The successful hatchery propagation efforts are extremely important because the clock is ticking for the endangered pallid sturgeon. Some of our, our earlier estimates from several years ago indicated that perhaps there's maybe as few as 50 uh, reproductive condition adults in the Missouri River upstream of Fort Peck Reservoir. There's maybe 125 to 150 reproductive condition adults between Fort Peck Dam and the headwaters of Lake Sakakawea, includes, you know, the Yellowstone. Since the hatcheries began helping recover the pallid, nearly 400,000 juvenile pallid sturgeon have been stocked in recovery plan management areas one, two, and three, and most seem to be surviving and doing quite well. It takes 10 to 15 years for pallids to reach sexual maturity, and the hatchery propagation program has only been successful since 1997, with juveniles stocked beginning in 1998 for the upper basin. Biologists are optimistic that these fish will go on to reproduce in the wild with natural recruitment. In the upper basin, some pallids implanted with a transmitter have been tracked up to 250 river miles. So we've had fish go all the way up to intake, which is about 70 miles from the confluence, come back down to the confluence, and come 180 miles up, up the Missouri River and come back down. So seeing 500 miles is, isn't very common, but they are able to do, make those long migrations. Beyond the research, hatchery program, monitoring and tracking, the pallid sturgeon recovery effort is also looking at ways to improve the habitat for these endangered fish. One of the restoration programs that's going on right now deals with um, the intake diversion dam on the Yellowstone River. And the intake diversion dam is viewed as a, an impediment to pallid sturgeon migration. So a few agencies are working on modifying that intake diversion structure and putting in some kind of a, a new structure or a new bypass system that will allow pallid sturgeon to move up the Yellowstone system, go further up than they currently can now, spawn farther up in the system, and that would provide additional distance for the, the free embryos and larvae to drift before they entered Lake Sakakawea. Based on research to date, the major key factors needed for recovering and delisting the pallid sturgeon include provide a more naturalized hydrograph or river flow 
comprised of both a spring rise from snowmelt and low summer base flows. Allow warm water releases out of the dams during the summer months. Lessen or eliminate hydro-peaking flows. Re-evaluate congressionally authorized purposes of the Missouri River to see if these purposes established in the 1940s are consistent with societal needs in the 21st century. Provide a means of passage for pallids around the dams to mimic a more natural pre-dam river. Maintain or improve Missouri River water quality. Encourage sloughing easements to prevent bank stabilization so that the natural river habitat forming processes such as erosion and sediment deposition can continue or be improved. Establish a floodway of undeveloped river corridors on important river segments, taking care not to destroy personal property. This will allow the Missouri and its major tributaries to move so floodplains can be reconnected to restore and re-establish hydrological and ecological functions. But even with them, will it be enough to reverse the path towards extinction for this endangered species? With pallids, they could be a, a museum fish. We're, I mean, we're successfully catching them, spawning them in hatcheries and stocking them out. I mean, we could, in theory, do that in perpetuity. It may end up being that might be our only option, depending on you know, the public process of what we can and cannot do, you know, management-wise on the Missouri River. That, that is something that we can treasure and carry forth for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and the next generations to come to show that, yeah, we took care of things and we made sure that this species was uh, able to survive despite what we did to the river. Out of care and respect for this senior citizen of the Missouri River system, Perhaps the pallid sturgeon won't become merely a specimen in a scientific collection. With continued recovery efforts to include research, planning, habitat improvement, and river management compatible with the life history needs of the pallid sturgeon, this ghostly inhabitant of murky waters may survive and once again naturally thrive in the water so that future generations of people can experience the intrigue of this pale survivor whose ancestors were of the dinosaur era and 80 million years of evolution.